going to take over, Michael Collette, and we're very happy to have him here. Uh, he is uh, a very passionate uh, believer in the promise of ACR, automatic content recognition, and he works with us very closely throughout the year to try to uh, uh, make sure that we are well aware of what's going on in this crowd. So I want to entrust this session with him. He knows everybody in this space. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, well, hey, so uh, Thanks, everybody, for uh, turning up for this. Um, today's panel is actually not really about technology at all. We've done a bunch of ACR tech panels. There are a bunch of them at this show. This is really more about what ACR enables. And um, you know, it's kind of based on an open question, which is, do we see what might be the start of a fundamental transition in the core medium of television? So we have uh, a terrific collection of panelists. Um, Chris Faulkner, who's the Vice President of Advanced Advertising, has joined us from NBCU. Matthew Giles, the Director of Emerging Technologies from Turner. David Preisman, VP of Interactive Television, and a man who's done a great many of these apps for a great many years from Showtime. Russ Schaefer, who leads the charge at Yahoo um, and is uh, senior, direct, senior Director of Product Marketing for Yahoo Connected TV. Ashley Schwartz, uh, recently of Digitas, now on her own with Furious Minds. Wendell Wengen. Um, the Director of Advertising Interactive Television at LG Electronics. Um, these are all folks who are heavily involved in the mix, making this stuff happen right now. So uh, exciting stuff. Um, I thought it worth, uh, not everybody knows what ACR TV means. It might be a term that only means something to me, so I thought I would take a moment and just take a minute to, to define it. So um, there's a lot of talk about ACR, automatic content recognition, right? So identifying content, playing on a device. Mm -hmm. ACR Hello. TV, Hello. Um, is very specifically what? You speak into that. You keep turning, so you're turning away from your mic. Right. No, I keep, they're here. They're there. What are we supposed to do? We're in the round. It's not easy. <laughs> I know. Well, there's some back here too. I'm not going to ignore them. Um, so, so, anyway, so when we perform content recognition directly on the TV, that actually enables us to do things directly on the TV, and it's somewhat different by comparison to things we've talked about and seen a fair amount of um, on two screen. So that's what we're focused on, how ACR, content recognition, actually on the TV allows us to do stuff on that TV and related devices. Why do we need it, right? Why do you care? And that's because all smart TVs that ship today are totally blind to the television content that they are displaying. They get pixel data from a set-top box. They do not know when you're watching 30 Rock, right? And if they don't know that you're watching 30 Rock, there is no way to associate the smarts of the TV with that 30 Rock viewing session. That is what ACR does. It builds a bridge between the internet and the television business, right? It's a really big deal. So it allows the internet to see television and thereby to transform TV. I love my silly graphics. All right, so with that, I thought we, we've got a bunch of video examples. This is the first time I've been able to show anything that actually you know, represented the medium. Um, we'll kick off with Russ and an overview video. I have all these things to queue up. Give me a moment. Give me another moment. So I was working on that. What you're going to see is... Now pause it for a second. Do not have audio? Shh. Vote for your favorite character and see real-time results. Purchase clothing highlighted on the TV show. Interact with TV ads and get more information, order sample products, or even request a test drive at your local car dealer. Connect your tablet and smartphone to your TV. Take advantage of gestures for navigation and keyboards for text entry. Play videos and photos on your tablet related to the TV show you're watching. Push videos from your phone to play on your TV. And you can do it all from your living room. Yahoo Connected TV, Internet Enhanced TV. Should have given you a chance to set that up. So, explain what's different about broadcast interactivity by comparison to the original implementation of Yahoo Connected TV. So, Yahoo Connected TV has been around since 2009. So, we're in millions of televisions across 135 countries. And the initial premise was building an app ecosystem of content that people are already consuming 
on other devices they bring in the living room, whether it be a tablet or phone or PC, by giving them quick and easy access to that. And that's what we did and rolled that out. And as we kind of moved forward, there's a lot of apps and it became apparent that people also, while they're watching TV, want additional content related to what they're watching. So we rolled out a system called Broadcast TV that implements an ACR sensor that's built into the television that detects what you're watching. And then we can actually go in that library of apps, find the actually interesting content that relates exactly to what you're watching, bring it to the exact page within that app where there's relevant content, allow you to immediately consume that. In addition, we can also create something on the fly that actually is from internet content from a partner that never existed as an app that could also be served right along with that program, TV show, or with that advertisement. So we initially started rolling that out with a couple of key partners, Showtime uh, being one of those, uh, Home Shopping Network being another, and of others that, that we announced. Uh, and also in the advertising area, we also wrote out some interesting examples from Fidelity and Mercedes, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So the key thing is that not only do you recognize the fact that we wanted to basically find content that was out there that was related to what you're watching, but also then make it immediately available and then connect in tablets and phones because people are also bringing those into the living room. So allow people then to also, as you saw from the video, serve content based upon those devices and be more personalized to that individual person. So you could have something on the tablet that's not on the TV uh, based upon what their interests are and do more targeting based upon that. So now we have an ecosystem that includes the television, tablets, phones, all with the intelligent capability to recognize what's being watched and serve relevant content to the specific device that makes sense. So that's what we rolled out. It's in production. It's on 2012 Sony televisions out today, as well as upgrading 2011 TVs from Sony as well. So the first one out in production, and we're learning a lot from that, working with partners like David uh, to enhance the experience and figure out what works, what doesn't work. And so far, it's been pretty successful. Awesome. So the very beginnings of ACR TV, Yahoo's got it started this year, the first ones to get it going. And, and again, the main thing is the smarts of the TV, the Yahoo Connected TV platform, the whole Yahoo back end are now sentient. They know what's on TV, they have time code, they can have very smart, active, very precisely coordinated applications coming from the internet on top of that live TV broadcast. That's where we start. So, as I said, something of a hypothesis that perhaps the arrival of ACR on TVs, smart TVs, is driving something of a transition in the medium. The left column, I'm not going to read all the points, you all can read, but the left column are the things that we can now do that we could never do, right? We don't really have any targeting on broadcast television. We don't have anything called hybrid TV. We'll show it to you in a little bit. These are all really fundamental new attributes of the TV viewing experience, fundamental new tools in a developer's toolkit, right? On the right-hand side, the various categories, and actually the more time I spend on this, the longer that, that list gets, there just turn out to be a great many things that a boy or a girl can do with this tool set. So we'll get into it. So um, we're gonna talk a little about content. I thought it was worth noting that this is the big picture that scares everybody in the world. This is what actually has happened to the, to the newspaper business. It's what the TV business has thus far managed to stave off. And the question is, will ACR have any role in continuing the TV business's success in avoiding that outcome? But the recent data suggests that the problem is starting, right? This is the actual slip in the audience recently. Things are changing in TV land. There are a lot of cable networks that have seen their audiences decline lately. That's never, ever happened before, right? So that slide may not be quite as precipitous as the previous chart, but there are cracks in the armor. All right, so with that, I'm going to let Mr. Prizman show you some examples of stuff he has created. Where do you want to start? Just on the first slide. All right. Hit present. Thank you. I mean, um, I think the first thing that I just want to stress is just I think this is a really significant um, change in the capabilities that are offered through ACR and TV. I, I just want to quickly just compare this to a two-screen tablet experience. Uh, and there's great work being done on two-screen. I just want to show how this technology is fantastic. What we're talking about right now, if a programmer wants to do a two-screen app, and we've got one, we need to promote it and market it. The consumer has to have a tablet. They have to go to an app store, find it, if it's not on the home page or on one of the top lists, install it. Then when they're watching our show, they have to get their tablet, have it in the room with them, launch the app, and the ACR there will allow it to synchronize. What is possible with ACR in the TV, built in at the platform level, is you're watching TV and you click one button. 
That's what we're talking about. So I think it's a game changer. Um, all of the capabilities that, all of the things that we've wanted to do at this conference for years on traditional ITV are possible, but there's a broadband connection. It's in HDTV, you know it's in HDTV. You got beautiful graphics and high resolution. Um, I have some numbers here from Forrester that I got permission to share with the crowd. I had to get special permission, but um, the top line is the total households, uh, the total US TV households. Uh, the bottom numbers are the projected growth uh, of connectable TVs. They call them that because they're not gonna try to forecast how many of them are plugged in. Um, I wanna say personally, I think what is in the press about the connection rates is actually quite low. Maybe we'll talk about that uh, a bit later, but with Wi-Fi in the newer sets, the connection rates are actually really, really good. And in the case of Showtime, uh, our connection rates are actually, we know this from research that we do, customers that have a channel like ours are, are much higher because uh, they're higher end customers who get HBO and Showtime are the ones that have the newer TV sets. Uh, so what you have here is an example uh, of what Russ was talking about, the project we're doing on the Yahoo platform. And for the viewer at home, it's this simple. You're watching a fight, a prompt shows up on the screen, and you push a single button, and you're in our app. Um, it's the Yahoo platform, so it's within their framework and their, their UI uh, structure. Um, but it's that seamless for us to connect a viewer with content that they're interested in. We control what's here, what page we drive them to, and what content we make available, synchronized with the program. Are you able to share? I mean, I'll say in general, um, this category of, um, uh, of you know, ITV, where it's program synchronous content, we're, we're presenting a prompt to the viewer, we do really, really well. Um, I'd say at the low end, like 10, 11%, we've done up to 23, 24%. Those are phenomenal numbers. I'm not talking like 1%. Like, you know, if you got our worst number, 10%, I mean, that's phenomenal if that many of your viewers can interact. Now, you have to take into account how many of them have a smart TV, but the, the reason we think we get such good numbers is because people are watching the show because they're fans of this content. It's, it's perfectly targeted. That's what we're trying to present. So, so just to clarify, because some of these concepts are familiar to us and less to everybody else, in, in ACR TV parlance, you basically have an invitation to interact, right? That's this first button that appears on screen. And so the opt-in rate is the percent of people who saw that invitation that actually participate. And the numbers he's sharing are an order of magnitude larger than most people, I think, expect. They're enormous, right? Um, so anyway, Albert. Yeah, let's keep going. Um, here's an example of a, a thing that we're working on. Uh, there's a number of companies out there now um, playing with stuff. Um, and um, so th the concept here is you're watching a commercial or a promo for a series on Showtime. A prompt appears on the screen. The viewer clicks a single button and they could follow us on Facebook. I mean, think about the value uh, that that represents real world practical uh, impact that the stuff can deliver from day one. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so um, I have a concept piece here we're working on I wanted to share with you. This is in no means something that we're definitely doing. We're just sort of playing around. I also want to warn you, uh, it's a Showtime program. This is some <laughs> adult language. Uh, but let's just take a look at this clip. I think I'll, I'll narrate it. So you've already opted in now. How was your day? Uh, but this is an example of the uh, sort of quality weird. and the graphic fidelity well, that we think we're going to be able to achieve uh, on the Close. Connected TV ACR platforms. And I don't even care. Sure you didn't care. No, I don't. And if you anyway, compare this with sort of the EBIF stuff that we've all seen out there, um, it kind of blows it away. I don't know if you guys can see it's towards the bottom of the screen. But there's some transparency going on. You see the, transi the transition. Really nice. And actually what we're doing here is collecting votes in real time and updating them on the fly as people around the country are voting while they're watching the show. Awesome. So let's keep, let's keep going. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, real, really lucky and really want to thank David for bringing that stuff in. It's very hard to get examples of this stuff in a public forum like this, so it's wonderful to have it. All right.
So um, with that rather long intro, um, I think you covered it in terms of the creative difference. I mean, let's, let's pop it over now to some of the other folks on the content side of this. I mean, I'm really curious, because I mean, we've, we've talked to both of you guys a bit, but, but in, in, for this audience, how do you guys see Enhanced TV impacting the business at the network level? How do you guys view this? Where's the, what are the opportunities? What are the areas you want to exploit with it? Um, length of engagement with folks, uh, so that we think that's a good piece. And then obviously the advertising, um, we do a lot of sponsorships. Sponsorships are how we, how we show or sell a lot of our shows, uh, especially on our entertainment networks. And we believe that uh, this type of interactivity outside of, you know, all the ITV stuff we've done before um, really brings um, a lot higher usage rates we anticipate. We don't have any data behind that yet, but the ease and simplicity that David talked about is really kind of where we see that being able to drive it. I mean, I think it's the consumer making an application that's really easy to use, that has some very good cons uh, consumer value to it, that um, just they look at as the next evolution of TV. It's not really the technology that is. The technology will drive it from the back end, but it's really the experience that our creative teams come up and how to use it. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see ACR inside on any box on television manufacturing. No, we shouldn't soon. use ITV either <laughs> as right, an right. acronym when Great. we go well, talk about what it. What would you add, Chris? Oh, no, I think that's exactly right. I think you know our content producers work very hard to, to come up with this, this additional content and having this very simplified way for our viewers to get to that and I mean, and you can take this to the next you know, level, whether it's on the main screen, whether you, know, you talked about synchronized to a tablet, you know, can drive stuff to that tablet, it can drive a download of an app to a tablet, all those kinds of things. We're building all this extra content, making it easier for our viewers to consume is what it's all about. And on the ad front, it's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's you know, you mentioned the, the higher quality of interactivity that you can do. They just, you know, the TVs have a much bigger uh, more robust chipset in them than right. you know a lot of the legacy set-top boxes. So we were able to do different things um, to bring new and exciting things for our advertisers. Add anything, Russ? Yeah, I think the the other part of it is and the engagement is key. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. And, and as people consume content across many different devices, the idea is to follow them and provide them entertainment experiences no matter where they happen to be. Right. And that's sort of our our philosophy is coming from the digital side is to work with partners uh, like the networks to enable engagement when it comes to that TV screen that also carries through to the, the PC, to the tablet, to the phone, and then the TV right. becomes that next engagement mechanism. So as consumers want to go leave the living room and continue to consume that content, you can follow them with either engagement or with advertisement sponsorships like we did in the Mercedes campaign across PC, tablet, phone, and then television. So it was kind of an all-inclusive look at uh, reaching the consumer no matter what device they happen to be on, that seems to be where things are trending. That's not everybody, right. uh, because there's a lot of time people spend still in front of the television that's still the number one medium. By far, 40x times uh, video consumption on TV versus other devices, so it is definitely a big delta there. But, but as you look at the different types of demographics, they are trending that way. And as we go forward, it's great to have a solution that sort of takes that into account and can move across all four screens. I think the other key piece is that ACR works on delayed or on-demand viewing. Right. So, yeah. you know, all the stuff that we're doing, we can do a lot of these cool apps now um, without ACR um, or with very periodic ACR where you push a button and it knows where you are that moment. Um, but it, this allows, you know, if the person pauses and comes back to the show two minutes later, it allows you to continue to have that fully synchronized experience yeah. or if they're watching it off their DVR, uh, hopefully with all the commercials, um, <laughs> or off VOD or anything else, right. that same experience could be presented to them, which we can't really do easily yeah. today. So, so one of the interesting things um, about this technology is it would seem to address that part of the demographic that is softening the most, ra most rapidly among TV viewers, right? So young people, for the most part. That's where there is some drop off in audience. How much, when you guys are talking about strategy at a corporate level, how much does that matter that this is actually a way to address what might be the soft spot in the television audience for the current product? Did it come up? Yeah, I, I don't think that that's the driver right now for us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Should be. Yeah. Um, no, personally think. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, you, you <laughs> Michael you would go. like to be on your advisory board. That's right. That's he, he, right. He tries. That's he tries. Right. Should be. Um, and, and I guess, Wendell, for you guys, when you look at um, the different kinds of things that ACR can be used for, what, what, what is it most attractive? What, is, what drives a manufacturer's interest in all this stuff? I think there's a couple of things uh, that, that we're looking at <clears throat> as, um, as a large manufacturer, as a second largest TV manufacturer, so we bring scale to enabling this. We look at uh, ACR as being a set of tools, as you mentioned, that bridge uh, internet with uh, linear TV, and we're providing the capability underlying that to, to networks and, uh, and programmers um, to create that. So I think that's, uh, that, you know, that's the main way that we're looking at it. All right, so just, just one last question before we move on. So there's kind of experimentation and there's early projects. At what point, in terms of households to the Forrester diagram that have, you know, ACR actually hooked up in their home, at what point does this become an important business activity? Where, where does this kind of tip and become a serious business for the, for the networks? Any of you guys? I mean, I, I can't give you exact numbers, but I, I would say we're probably about two to three years from now. But I think there's an opportunity within actually the next 12 months to prove this out. And if you can uh, prove this out with a certain number and you look at the projections and you multiply out, I think it's possible to prove substantial value uh, from what this technology can offer in the next 12 months, absolutely. From an advertising perspective, the typical magic number that differentiates, if, if you're always asked, typically the party line is between a test versus a buy. Uh, is a million, and and let's be clear, that's a million active users that have connected televisions that can passively receive that sort of call to action. That's cool. We get there fast. Um, all right, onward. So, Russ, we we spent some time talking a few months ago about this, but I think it's great to revisit. And this this is an illustration of a whole bunch of stuff. So maybe you can kind of go over quickly how the Mercedes campaign worked, and then we'll talk a little bit about the hybrid TV bit after you introduce it. I think I talked about it a little bit earlier about the approach was to reach consumers whatever screen they might be on. And this was focused on the NCAA basketball tournament time period. So that, that certain month and having that sponsorship uh, be alive during that entire month. And look at it from two perspectives. One was whenever a Mercedes commercial came on, providing additional content for the consumer to get access to immediately based upon whenever the ad ran. And of course, our system allows a consumer, if they, for example, missed it, to go back and look at the history uh, app and actually pull up any kind of content that was actually served during the time period they may have walked away to the refrigerator or what have you. So that's enabled as well. And then as it came to the Yahoo Sports app where we had NCAA tournament uh, content, they actually also saw uh, the Mercedes ad and could click into the same content that you saw related to the commercial. So that kept it consistent, provided it to the consumer wherever they happened to be at and provided multiple points for them to get access to it. And of course, that was just the TV experience. Then of course, they saw it on the tablet, the phone, and the PC as well. So it crossed all four mediums and allowed them to have kind of a holistic campaign and to experiment with bringing it into the living room. I mean, high quality videos, commercials, added value content, if they wanted to, they could have actually uh, found a local dealer, but at this point, we didn't, uh, we didn't do that experience. But the great thing about it is this is all ad served. They never actually, in essence, uh, created an app for this. We created it from assets they provided and served it on the fly. So in a sense, we enabled it to be all ad served. So from an onboarding process for an advertiser, this is extremely easy the, compared to having to go build an application and then actually deploy it out and drive demand for it. So we provided, I think, a seamless way for consumers to get access by prompting them one button, you get the information for the advertiser, an easy way for them to come on board get the assets, deploy them across more, more than one screen, and reach the consumer where they might be consuming the content. So screens are screens are screens. You can't necessarily tell whether that's an iPad or a 42-inch TV. That's a 42-inch TV. And so this is a still frame of an ad that was running, right? And what's interesting here, one of the things that I think is a really remarkably powerful tool that comes with these new smart TVs in an ACR setting is I can have a button, I'm watching whatever ad on whatever network, I can have a button in this app that's going to launch a video. The video is coming from the internet. And so now all of a sudden, I've created an app layer which serves as a switch. 
between a broadcast video session and a broadband video session. And that's what's one I refer to as hybrid TV, the ability to switch back and forth to combine broadcast sources and broadband sources to achieve different results. In this case, to telescope and ad offering. That's obviously pretty valuable to an advertiser. Yeah, I think the other thing to look at the way it's designed, uh, it's maybe hard to tell, is that the TV uh, video is always prioritized. So you'll see it's kind of moved to the right. We call that viewport mode. So nothing is overlaying actually what's on the video stream. So that's extremely important uh, for the advertiser as well as a broadcaster, depending upon what other information they might have within that video stream. And that can sort of be automatically enabled or the consumer can sort of toggle that themselves. So that allows basically complete un unfettered access to the primary video that they're viewing at that time, as well as access to broadband delivered content that's on the left-hand side. You can kind of consume those together. And if you want to take over the right. full screen for, say, a big video, then you could do that, but that's a consumer choice. Right. So that's the benefit of how we've sort of designed it to where it allows both parties, uh, the person serving the broadcast stream as well as the application content to be uh, equally prioritized and allow people to view both. Right. So, so one of the things when I was looking and spending time talking with Russ about this that really caught my eye was every other example I had seen up to that point, for the most part, the media assets, the application and so forth was custom built for the TV viewing session, right? It was, it was very specifically an enhanced TV experience. In this case, we're really taking a digital media campaign and we're extending it to broadcast interactivity and we're using a whole bunch of back-end assets that had uses all over the different device platforms, right? And what's interesting about that is if you speak with Ashley, she's concerned that the traditional ways of buying and selling television may not apply. Would you like to elaborate? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I'm very excited about this space because from the perspective of representing brands and advertisers, you know, the lion's share of their dollars are still spent in television. Um, and the opportunity to take what right now is sort of a reach medium that doesn't really drive to measurable or sort of measurable proof points of value or you know, business value creation, meaning directly driving a P&L, whether through lead generation or revenue, the fact that this enables that and is, can be the connective tissue, I'm incredibly excited about that. Right, but the reality is that you know TV is still where the bread is also buttered by the folks that make content, right? And some still have separate P&Ls between their digital and their television guys and gals that are selling 30 seconds. So, at the end of the day, if you have a place where the lion's share of the revenue is spent, and the lion's share of the revenue is earned, I'm concerned that what is now a nascent emerging space, although its potential and possibilities are limitless and exciting, it will be devalued quickly, as was early stage display and web inventory, by virtue of just being sort of given as a value add. And when you're sitting on the buying side, um, until recently that was my purview, you know, when you hear sort of presentations about what is now en vogue is the second screen, but you talk about the possibilities of this, it's like, how do you value a Facebook like? I don't know. And it's the same when you talk about an audience on average that, you know, when you can assume in a major league sports finals, a second screen application gets no more than a 5,000 check-in rate, it's hard to value the, that audience. And if you can't figure out how much to charge for it, you're probably going to give it to, uh, for free. Right. So there's, there's some really interesting questions about how this is sold and how it is monetized and by whom. And I mean, the market structure is very, very early. It's not really the topic of today, so we're not going to go too deep into it. And we talked about it all night, all night last night. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it is. Over it's, a it's, box it, of wine. It, <laughs> that is not true. It was good Italian wine. Let her, let her, let her not scandalize this crowd. Um, no whips. Um, so, uh, but there, there are some very, very interesting questions out there about how the market shapes up and how there, there's, you know, how the, the players in the marketplace coordinate within the duration of a 30 minute linear spot or linear piece of content. So very, very interesting stuff coming. Uh, just to, to briefly dwell a little bit more on the hybrid TV concept, there have been some other really interesting examples that we don't have here today, but that I've seen that are live. Um, one is... You know, you can imagine that television programming networks are sort of vexed by the fact that they are linear. I can only show a show followed by a show, and yet I have this massive library of content. Show number one might target 25 to 54 year old women, right? Well, show number two coming next might be targeting 18 to, 19, 18 to 49 males, and the odds of me keeping that person are low as I switch that, as I cross that programming scene. 
So I could pop up an application that was largely designed to recommend content available from my over-the-top servers that address the person I currently have with the specific goal of keeping them and possibly moving them onto a highly targeted advertising platform where I make very large CPMs, right? So there's some very interesting implications of that switch, right? There's lots and lots and lots of uses of it. I just called out a couple, but I, as we're exploring whether or not we're giving birth to a fundamental change in the television medium, to me, this is one of the things that hugely differentiates this new platform from all previous, in quotes, ITV platforms, right? I'm sorry, any comments on that before I move on? Just a little observation of my own. Yeah, and I think you can surface that content either over the top, but you could also work with our programming, or our, our distribution partners right. to pull oh. it through VOD. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's Absolutely. a dual, dual stream there. Right, and in fact, I guess you could even, no, no, you couldn't. Another idea, another time. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, so, but let's go back to the advertising thing for a second. There are a lot of different virtues here. The telescoping one we could add to the list. Um, you know, you guys who, who are engaged in the business of monetizing this, and I'll start with you, Ashley. I mean, you've spent time talking about these capabilities with advertisers for a while. What's the demand side look like? Well, it's interesting. When I started to build the practice at my former agency, I mean, that was, was almost two years ago, I was very bullish about addressable and advanced television and sort of started to dive into it and realized that, you know, we were, we were quite far off. And I think one of the, the greatest points that I heard was um, it was at one of the, uh, the advanced advertising uh, studies that we did as an agency. Um, a gentleman from uh, Comcast said, you know, the, what's the point of being able to target at the household level if you can't dynamically serve the ad inventory? And so I think that's a great point, is that even if we're able to target, which is incredibly compelling and would create a substantial disruption, obviously, in a medium that is not targeted today, um, if you can't actually optimize day part target, you still have to deliver it with a tape two weeks in advance. You know, sort of these old endemic elements of television advertising remain, the targetability doesn't isn't very valuable, you know? And th the targetability we talk about now is really sort of third-party blind database matching, right? So I think there's an interest, but there is, you know, we have to call spade a spade about sort of what is inherently the business model within the agency industry. And that is that, you know, creative is separate above the line, below the line. So TV buyers buy TV and digital buyers buy digital, and they buy in very different ways. And I think what is the biggest challenge to us as an industry to sort of, you know, to, to get this space to accelerate and make the curve faster, steeper, everything as far as the dollar spent, is how do we straddle that chasm between buying on GRPs and buying on CPM or performance and using data to make more intelligent buying decisions and to not just set it and forget it and spend all your money in the second corner and then actually traffic it optimize it, measure it, reconcile performance, do all of the laborious things that make the return on investment in digi digital better, but also make the operational side of digital very expensive and labor intensive. So you guys, any comments? I mean, you all have been in some degrees socializing these, turn these ideas or selling these, these value propositions. I mean, where are you seeing actual advertiser interest in terms of the different virtues of the platform? What, what's the draw? I think getting back to the multi-screen is, uh, is Ashley's mentioning is that the the TV piece is is its early days, and uh, the great thing about the way we've designed our platform is to have one analytics capability across all. So it's a web-based platform. It's in a sense came from a PC-based uh, device. Our um, our desktop widgets was the original source for our engine, so it was PC-based, and so it carried forward all those analytical capabilities. Uh, that can track any of our applications on our platform. So if you're an eBay user, it's the same login, the same tracking, the same personalization, the same everything, and that carries through. And that's gonna help a lot with sort of the, the analytics across different screens and seeing the differences and being able to map against some of the performance expectations and seeing how those play out. But I think there's also, just as she mentioned, there's this difference in looking at the TV space and they just have to keep that in mind. And I think early days it's gonna be multi-screen selling with constant analytics that are the same, and then seeing how that sort of plays into the pricing models that are predominant today in the TV industry for, for ads. And I think the other piece that's critical that, that Ashley mentioned was, you know, there's TV buyers and there's digital buyers. In some agencies, those are 
different agencies even. I mean, some clients, those are different agencies. A lot of times they're at least different groups. Um, this is a starting to, or the continuation of blending those two together. So if you're going to run something that's a digital enhancement over a linear TV ad, both groups have to be working together and, you know, and coordinating their efforts. And I think that's, that's another piece that's gonna have to evolve as this grows. Um, I think that's part of the model that over the next couple years as we figure this out together, um, that that model has to evolve as to how you, how the agencies handle that as well as how the, the programmers yeah. uh, handle that. I agree. Internally, it's, a, it's an issue we have to sort through as well. But so I'm just kind of getting back to the question. Um, what is it about enhancing an ad, though? So if you're if you're in there and you're sitting down with X Y Z brand and they're you're having a discussion with them about why they should enhance their ad, what is the what what do they get that they really want? I mean, is it a name? Is it a transaction? Is it just time? And I've actually got their brain pulled off their iPad. I mean, what what is it that you think that really draws the advertiser? To, what's the value proposition of an enhanced ad that pulls? It depends. I, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, the honest okay. answer. Okay. If it's Mercedes, they may be looking for a quote unquote qualified lead showing up at a dealer, and that be, may be the metric they're looking for. Mm -hmm. If it's uh, a soft drink manufacturer, it may be a digital coupon sent to a phone that then gets redeemed. I mean, there's, there's a broad spectrum depending on what the advertiser is and what their goals are. Some advertisers it may just not work for. I mean, some of them may want to do some of the targeting stuff. Um, you know, high-end toilet paper and low-end toilet paper, that may be kind of the extent of what they're doing. Yeah, you know, actually, a, a oddly, pack of, that's a big deal. <laughs> a, a, a pack of gum, you know, the, the, yeah. the lead generation cost for a pack of gum has to be really small. So yeah, they may I, not want to do a lot that costs a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a, a grocery couponing company that shall remain nameless that uh, basically makes, you know, seven, eight hundred million dollars a year simply varying the coupon value between 50 cents a dollar and two dollars by segmented audience based on that brand's perception of who's valuable to them or not. And that's a really big business. But I think there's a very, I mean, look, the theme here is that in order to realize the value of ACR being native to the hardware of the television set, right, that potential is only realized if, if there is a disruption in how television is bought and sold today, right? Because I don't think, I mean, there's this retrenchment now with the sort of pre the premium, um, you know, for video CPMs because there's a shortage of premium video that, you know, you've got AOL and Google talking about eGRPs, right? Well, th the idea is that, okay, well, if we sell video like television is bought, then we can tap into TV dollars to sell video, right? I mean, that's, right. that's the rationale. Right. And I think what is, what is the reality is that by virtue of who's the first mover on these platforms, like Yahoo, we're not going to sort of reverse engineer the process and go back to selling connected TV, you know, mechanisms and, and experiences on a GRP basis. So the eventuality is that television has to catch up. And until it catches up, it's very difficult for the folks that are buying it based on the sheer number of eyeballs tuning into a program to convert that into value creation right. that is something very specific and performance-based and much more higher touch of a transaction of media acquisition. Right. I, I, it makes great sense. And I, I think that's the first time I really understood that point because you've made it to me several times. Um, the, the one thing I would offer to that, though, is it's what I, what I think you're describing is structurally really right on. And the, the scope of change in the industry, it's such a big business, right? But it's such a big business that early adopters represent three to four billion dollars in spend, right? And so in that respect, if you think of the traditional innovation curve, adoption curve, at least we're starting with 70 billion, I mean. That helps, right, in terms of getting blood into the system, right? Um, Wendell, I have a question for you. So, so um, from the point of view of a manufacturer, um, you have this ACR API, and it is capable of telling any entity what's on the TV. How do you decide who gets access to that API and who doesn't in terms of content, ads, whatever? Uh, let me first say that, that we don't uh, believe that the implementation of the ACR system in the long run is a differentiating feature for different TV manufacturers. We think that it'll be 
uh, just a basic uh, component of making and, and selling TVs. And, and you know, importantly, that um, the experiences that viewers will have on that TV will be, will be good ones, will be interesting ones, uh, will complement the programming they're watching. Um, we have uh, done, we've been working on this for some time. We haven't uh, uh, released anything quite yet. But uh, we, we do have a abstraction layer that we've implemented uh, in the TV that provides APIs to the application developer, which typically would be a network or a programmer. Um, and it's a very lightweight uh, implementation. Uh, the content is really HTML5. It's dynamically served. So it's not really, uh, when people think of applications, it's not a, a big piece of code that needs to be uh, discovered and downloaded and installed on the TV. It's something that gets, can be served very, very dynamically in a very lightweight fashion. So it's, um, I think it's a different view than maybe people are thinking on how applications are, are used on, for example, tablets and mobile phones. But I guess um, you know there are there are a great many people who might like to know what's on that TV, who might have a great many uses of that information, right? And the and the, kind of the crux of the question is, are there kind of rules of the road? And I, I, this might be just in your mind as to who gets access to that API at any given point in time. Right, right. So to specifically answer that question, I mean there are there are of course uh, a lot of interest in determining what's on the TV, and really there's two, uh, two use cases we can think about. Uh, knowing what's uh, on the TV to an application that's on the TV, and then also passing that information to a paired second screen device. And let's start with a paired second screen device because that's a much uh, uh, easier uh, discussion because uh, that is a experience that the viewer has initiated. Uh, they've launched this application, they've paired the device, and so the variety of, of kinds of uh, applications experiences on the second screen uh, that want to find out what's playing on the TV and, and provide some synchronized experience, some additional content, that's a pretty, that could be uh, open to you know, a number of different kinds of developers. What's on the TV, we do want to make sure that there's not a, uh, a conflict. And so there's uh, event management systems that are built into these uh, ACR systems, and we think that, at least in it's our opinion, programmers and networks are really in the best position to provide original content, companion content with their shows uh, that they've developed rather than, say, crowdsourced or other, other forms of uh, companion content. So, Michael, since I'm on a roll for better articulation today, maybe I could just call spade a spade and demystify what that conversation was for the audience that perhaps didn't get it. Um, it, it was, I'm an advertiser, right? Okay, and I want to generate leads or I want to deliver a coupon or I actually want to sell something off the backs of the millions of dollars I spend on television and that's a means by which to do it. Who do I go to to buy it? That's what we were just talking about. So, do I go to Yahoo? Because they sell to me every day on a performance basis. They generate me leads, they generate me clicks, they generate me you know, names. Or do I go to the networks because they're selling the experience and the content from which that lead generation or, or performance-based delivery mechanism is, is delivered. Right. And that's a big issue, right? And right now, the hardware guys sort of are at a place of saying whoever they're going to give access to, whoever's application has the, the freedom to listen to that linear stream and then is first in the pecking order to, to deliver something or telescope into it is basically one that has the rights to sell that experience or that inventory and profit from it. Oh, you're talking about your time? <laughs> well, you know, so, the, so, so, all right, so this was, the, this was the discussion last night, and it's a very interesting one, and, and, so, 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 so Roland, it, it turns out that that's a terrific question, right, and, and I think that what, what we were talking about last night was fundamentally, if you look at a 30-minute play out, there's, seven, 20 minutes, 22 minutes of content, there's the remaining minutes of advertising, much of which is national and some of which is managed by you, right? So there's really at least three players, right? Content guys, national advertising guys, and local advertising guys. 
But if each of the advertisers starts to act independently, there could be 15 players in an hour, right? And the, well, and so the, and the question then becomes, how does the industry manage that, right? And, and, and I think it's important, I do not believe, I know there are a lot of opinions about this, but I do not believe it is clear who controls the graphics layer during the ad display. The ad that's appearing, copyrights hold, held by the advertiser. The ability to modify that, there are a lot of opinions about that. Certainly Yahoo, when they're running their Mercedes campaign, felt that they were perfectly free to modify that ad, and it didn't need to be discussed with a network or a local. So this uh, is one of the reasons why I think if you talk to you, the programmers, you know, we have knowledge of where that two minutes that belongs to our distribution partners is, and we have very large commercial relationships with them. Mm -hmm. So we're incented to partner with them or continue to partner with them so that we don't disrupt uh, the two minutes that, that belongs to them or the, whatever the time is that belongs to them. So I think that, you know, from a programmer perspective, you know, we have knowledge of those timelines. We can work and set to get around the parameters so that those types of collisions don't happen. Right, and that's, the, and, and I, hang on just a second, just a second. The, the, the very interesting thing is, if the world and the 30 minutes are under master control by the programmer, then the management of the collisions is easy. But the question becomes, what happens when Mercedes or Ford says, hey, I want to work with Joe Digital Media Agency, and, and it's my copyright, so there's no reason why a TV manufacturer, I'll point at that one, um, wouldn't make, make me aware of when my, when my ad appears. Could I just make a, a point about the difference between added value and value creation, right? So added value is a situation where I'm buying television and I can make those dollars work harder. But one of the platforms that I've had with, in evangelizing this space for the last you know, 18 months to my clients is, look, you can get on TV without actually buying TV. And I know that scares the, you know, jeepers yeah. out of you gentlemen, but the reality is that, you know, that may be an incredible hockey stick for this market of now people that are traditionally performance-based advertisers, of which there's a lot that spend a lot of money in there, like the financial services sector, you know, they're, they're going to be the market makers to actually create this new ecosystem by putting real substantive premium dollars in it. And, I'm and, sorry, I, you, and I, I, think, I think that's why we're probably involved with this on the TV side pretty early, mm -hmm. because we, I don't think we want others to be making that decision for us. We want to have a voice as that ecosystem is developing. Right. And I think from, from, a, from a Yahoo perspective, our uh, approach to this from the beginning has been partnering with broadcasters and partnering with advertisers. It's never been one side or the other. Uh, our announcement initially had all the key partners in it, a lot of different broadcasters. I think that's right. our approach to, to go, because it needs to be managed. Right. It needs to be coordinated, and, and, and I think and that's I, an intelligent approch to that. And I think, that, I mean, there's definitely going to be some rambunctious Silicon Valley startups who try to mess with that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's a very large business. It has very large partners, and, and I don't think any of the large partners have any interest in, in any way, you know, stepping on each other's toes. It's mostly a question of value add and managing the value add process. And so understanding how to orchestrate is a question. There, I don't know that we know how yet, but that's an interesting question. Yeah. My point here is the comment, should, the comment should, should be speak to the notion of the level playing field, right, At, to, your, to your point. It's great to see that the, the content community is allowing connected TVs to do stuff that until recently we were prohibited to do in terms of put stuff on screen and all that kind of willy-nilly. So that is changing. That's a good thing for the industry. My point is the battle for HDMI 1 and ultimately what happens to the consumer experience. Because, you know, during the 14 minutes now of interstitial material, the ACR is picking off stuff and lots of cool stuff is going on with whomever. And that two minutes an hour, you know, my platform that's got all this triggering capability, I can do all the stuff you've mentioned today, and we do do it today. You know, I'm actually out there, you know, doing that. But what happens when, you know, the TV is overlaying stuff on my overlay? From a, t from a user experience perspective, that's a nightmare. Um, you know, and, and, so, and they're... So the, the only, the only yeah, that is a nightmare. And, and yeah. the only good news is... The likelihood is that the Mercedes-Benz dealership didn't buy interactive overlay from you and from somebody else at the same time, right? So, so where that gets managed in the ad domain is the buyers buying it in one place, right? Well, well all these things are um, caused by the consumer. The consumer has to interact. The other thing that everyone needs to get, and I work for Showtime, we don't have advertising, so <laughs> not my problem. Uh, <laughs> But I did want to mention, I mean, 
Honestly, the big battle here is going to be whose remote control it is, because we're talking now about uh, the LG remote or the remote on the Sony TV running Russ's platform. There's going to be a battle of, over the remote. But keep in mind, whichever one the consumer chooses, they're the one taking uh, the action to cause an app to launch. Uh, prior to that, there's just you know, like an overlay uh, prompt. And, and I'll go back to say that as the programmer, I want the user experience to be as positive as possible. So, I mean, we understand, I think these are the issues we'll have to work through, but we don't want a cluttered experience. The last thing we want is to have a horrible user experience so that the next time a prompt comes up and says, would you like to interact, the person says, absolutely not, and digs through the 30 levels deep into the menu of their TV and says, turn this off. So none of us want that, so I think, you know, the, the, the best part of having a single person sort of coordinating, I won't use the word control, but I would say coordinating the, use, the different types of user experiences or the different pieces of interactivity, I think that helps us preserve a quality user experience for the viewer, which is ultimately what we all need. Who is that person that writes those business rules? I'm gonna argue that, I, I'm gonna argue that, I'm gonna argue that it's me. Objective third party. I'm not sure if we'll solve those problems that, on the, but no, on but the that, panel today. No, but, but I'm serious. That's, Let's that's have the guy real, without advertising. Yeah, the guy, the guy, dude, we're, we're getting you the t-shirt, just so you know. We're getting it made. Not your problem. We don't. But, um, Let's have a question. Uh, yes, I have just a question about Shazam, uh, and I think it's for Ashley. Do you have any feedback regarding the Shazam campaign that you can see with um, all the advertising that we see on the TV sets, where you can just Shazam an ad and have more information regarding an ad? It's kind of off topic. Really? Yeah. Does anybody want to comment? Nope. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole other game. So I'm going to punt that question. I respectfully decline. Any other questions? Close. OK. Uh, we covered from GRPs to CPCs. I think we know where Ashley stands on that. We are. <laughs> no, I mean, it, look, the, the, so this is a really exciting new thing happening, right? But it, it is opening up a huge number of really interesting questions. The good news is there's a ton of consumer value in there. I, you know, I skipped over my Kool-Aid slide. I don't know, how many of you guys think that this is the kind of thing that's going to materially improve consumer engagement in television? Hands. Yeah. Hands. See, I mean, I think that's a big deal, and that means that there's a lot of pressure on the various industry players to figure it out, right? I mean, we have to figure it out, and I think that that's part of, there's a very, very small amount of television that's going to get interactively enabled in the next 18 months, and during that time, we can start to figure this out. I think that's really one of the things that has to happen. All right. I think just to reemphasize a point that was brought out, the user experience, I mean, we, for the first two years, didn't run a single ad. Purely focused on understanding how consumers access content, and as you saw from the interface, it's a very subtle uh, presentation of do you want more information, and they choose whether they want to or not. And so I think that, in working with launching, we launched our platform with this capability, it was with the broadcast networks, it was with advertisers combined, coordinating to make sure that the user experience was preserved and that it was not disrupting the user experience. So um, I'm gonna close with some numbers. I get asked about this all the time. I rebuild these numbers from time to time. Um, this is actually a, a reasonably conservative outlook for total TV shipped in the United States, the growth in the percent of those that are uh, smart TVs connect the bull. Um, the attach rate, that number is actually lower than most right now, right? So I think that that's easily at 60%. What's interesting about it is you get this ACR capable market. That's the portion of TVs that attach. And starting tw basically this year, all of those TVs should have ACR in them. So one observation is by 2016, kind of mirrors the Forrester numbers, this is the size of cable, right? This is not a small thing that's happening. The gross math is enormous. But the other thing is that next line down, it's the unattached but upgradable market. If we have cool content and we have cool apps and this is a fun thing to do and I can vote put people off the island, we will see the portion of people who didn't attach initially who then do attach go up a lot. And so that 2016 number could easily be almost 100 million. That's the muscle in this talk, right? It's the muscle, and we're talking all linear television, so it's a really big business. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Sorry for telling you what to do.
Dave. I'll give you a hug.